You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. I want to invite Jed, Jed Asher up to do scripture reading for us. It's from Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7 for us. Thanks, Jed Asher. Hello, church. I'm Jed. Today I'll be reading Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. These are the true words of the living God. Thank you. Thank you, Jed, for reading scripture so well for us this morning. Talking to him, I think we were in the washroom, and he said he's not nervous. He wasn't. (laughs) Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Welcome to RHC. It's a joy to see all of you. Um, I've I've actually been traveling for quite a few weeks. I'm I'm back after uh, probably the longest time away in terms of Sunday, so it's really nice to be back in church. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie, and I'm one of the elders in the second congregation. It is my joy to bring God's word to us today. So uh, would you join me as we look to God in prayer? Father God, We want to thank you for this season as we celebrate the coming of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to celebrate in waiting, Lord, during this time. I pray that as we look at your text, that you would open your text to our our hearts and our minds. Lord, that it, it would not just be head knowledge, but Lord, that as we look at your word, you would transform hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to start by asking a question. What do you think is the most popular female name in the world? Anyone? Michelle? Sarah? Sarah? No, sorry. Mary? No, it's not Mary. Well, if you account for kind of variations in spelling, it's actually the name Sophia. You can see a Sophia sitting right up there. Um, Now, if I don't ask the next question, I know you will start pulling out your phones and Googling, so let me do that. What do you think is the most common male name in the world? John? John? Yeah, Jeff is right. It's Muhammad. Now, (laughs) Now, there are some amongst us who are very proud of our names, while others who have names uh, and wish that they were different. Or maybe there are some amongst us who give importance to names just based on circumstances. William Shakespeare's classic, Romeo and Juliet, gives us one such instance where a question which is pretty much immortalized in, in literature was asked by Juliet. So as we know, Romeo and Juliet come from two different feuding families, and it's because of the family names that they cannot be together. And Juliet, therefore, raises the all-important question, what's in a name? And then she goes on to answer herself by saying, that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. The context being that it didn't matter which family Romeo came from, he would still be the sweet Romeo that she knew. But what's the first thing we do when we meet a stranger? We introduce them by our name, right? That is our primary identity. Now, we might create identities around our achievements, our relationships, the jobs that we hold, the job titles, etc. But over a period of time, those status might change. It might even go away. So the name is really one thing that remains with us throughout. And that is where we see that we have our identity. And identity is a big deal. Now, in the Bible, we see that names are also very important and especially meaningful. Abram, as we know, followed the Lord who blessed him and gave him the name Abraham, which meant father of a multitude. We look at Jesus, who called a fisherman Simon. 
He called him to be his disciple, and then he gave him the name Peter, which meant rock. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus, so later with, with Peter's um, sermon at Pentecost, would be the foundation of the spreading of the church as we know it today. Now in Genesis, we see that Adam was tasked with giving names to everything that was put under his care. There was a sense of authority associated with giving names. But it isn't just authority. There is also intimacy that is involved with giving names. We see in John 10, Jesus saying that he calls his sheep by name. He knows us personally. In Luke, Jesus again tells his disciples, Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. In Isaiah 43, the Lord tells Israel, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. Isaiah 49, when Jerusalem says the Lord has deserted us, what does the Lord say? Even though a mother might leave a baby in her womb, I will never do that. I have written a name in the palms of my hand. When you name someone, it shows that there is intimate knowledge, a relationship, a privilege. We are now in that wonderful time of the year where it's December. It's a time where things generally slow down a bit. We kind of, we kind of wind down. We start taking stock of things. It's a relaxing time, but it's also a time of great celebration. We look forward to the new year. We look forward with hope. But this is also the season of Advent, a season of looking forward to the coming, the arrival, the birth of our Savior Jesus. Now in the Bible, Jesus is called with numerous names which point to who he is and what he has done for us. Our text today points to a time which is 700 years before Jesus came in flesh. It was really the prophet Isaiah who saw and proclaimed what was to come and he proclaimed the name of Jesus. Through Isaiah, God let his people know the fourfold name of the Messiah who was to come. And that's what Jed read for us earlier today. Given God revealed the names of the Messiah, and given how important the names are in the Old Testament, in the Bible, well, old and new, it is important for us to dig deeper into the name. So over the next four weeks, as Jeff said, we'll be looking at the four names of the Messiah that we find in Isaiah 9. But what we'll do today is we'll specifically look at the first one, which is Wonderful Counselor. So my sermon today is titled, Our Wonderful Counselor, and it's really focused on the first of those four names. And what I'll do is I'll try and piece together some of the broader context of Isaiah and hopefully use that to bring into context what it means to have a wonderful counselor. My hope today is that we recognize that our inherent sinful tendency is to actually look for counsel outside of God. We either look at our own selves or we look at people around us. And we do that because, A, we struggle to wait on him, and B, we do not see the full glory of his wonder. But God in his grace has given us a gift, a gift of a wonderful counselor, and that is found in the name of Jesus. So as I try and unpack this, we'll look at it from three perspectives or three points. My first point is a need for a counselor. Second is a choice of a counselor. And thirdly, God's provision for a wonderful counselor. We'll then end with some reflections and applications. Okay? So let's dive in. Now, our first point, our need for a counselor. Now, let's have a quick look at the historical context of Isaiah. And though, we were, though the passage is Isaiah 9, I think we need to go back a little bit, right? So we go back to Isaiah 7. And as I said earlier, this is kind of 700 years before Jesus came um, as, as flesh on earth. Now, on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean was a little country of Judah, right? And Judah was going through a very difficult time because they were facing an enemy that was very, very bad, probably even worse than the Roman enemies in terms of the oppression they were facing. And what was happening there is uh, in Isaiah 7, the king of Judah is King Ahaz, and he is flustered because Judah is going to be attacked very soon by, this, um, uh, uh, you know, by, by, by these two kind of... Um, uh, entities coming together, so it's the, it's the Syrians and the Ephraimites, right? So it's an alliance. That was the word I was looking for. They were unstoppable. They had already captured the northern part um, of the kingdom, and it was just a matter of time before they would come down to Judah. 
And at this point, we pick up Isaiah 7, chapter 1 and 2. It's in the screen, but let me read it. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. The attack on Judah was imminent. How did Ahaz and his people respond to this attack? Let's look at the next verse, verse 2. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as trees of the forest shake before the wind. Now, I grew up in India, and the school education process there is pretty rigorous, um, probably a little bit like how it's here in Singapore. There is huge pressure on a child from a very young age, and everything is geared towards the stream that he would choose when he moves into undergrad. And in India, you only had two streams. You had medical, engineering, and then you had the rest, right? And this was kind of many years back, right? It's changed now. And so we would all be in this factory, right, where we would try and kind of get into either one of these streams. If you did, it was like you've arrived, all right? You don't have to worry about your future. You'll have a job. You're secured. I got into that factory line as well in school, right? Working hard towards getting into one of the streams. I completed school. I completed my entrance test, and I managed to get into one of the streams. Actually, I scrambled through one of the, one of the streams, right? I was elated. I thought I had arrived. I was done, right? I didn't have anything to worry. It was a day of admissions, um, and I still remember. Um, I went for admissions alone. I didn't have anyone with me. There was chaos. There were some protests happening, and what that meant was there was a lot of confusion in that admission process. Everything was moving very, very fast. So I went, I, I chose a stream, and then we had to go through medical examinations. I did that, and after the test came out, the trees began shaking in my life just the way it was with Ahaz, right? Uh, the medical report said that I had uh, color blindness and that I wasn't eligible uh, to pursue the engineering stream. What would I do? Which way would I turn? I was all alone at the admission center. I didn't know who to turn for advice. I had no one I could seek counsel from. Now, you might say it's a little bit extreme if you compare the two, right? For Ahaz, it was a period of or decision of life and death. Well, if you ask an 18-year-old who had worked all his life, it probably was for him as well. Now, in those moments, we're forced to make decisions, um, you know, in, in a very short time. We've got to make quick decisions. In fact, our life is filled with moments where we have uncertainties and uncharted situations that we have no experience of. Our previous experiences hold no ground for what we go through. And I found myself in that situation. I was at a crossroad, and each moment required decision-making. Now, we constantly need to seek and, uh, and look for instructions and advice. And therefore, the question for all of us is not whether we have a counselor to guide us, but who our counselor is. And I believe that was the question that was facing King Ahaz and Judah as Syria and, the, and Ephraim was on the verge of attacking them. What would Ahaz do? How would he respond? Whose counsel would he speak? And that, therefore, was my first point, our need for a counselor. All of us in our life, every day, have a need for a counselor. Move to my second point, which is our choice of a counselor. Now let's see what happens. So follow with me that passage. It should be up on the screen. Isaiah 7, 3 and 4. So verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and Sheer Jeshab, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint, because of these two smoldering stumps of fire brands, at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Sorry, that was long. And then in Isaiah 7, 7 and 9, the Lord God said, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. And then he goes on to say that within 65 years, Ephraim would be shattered from being a people. And then he ends at verse 9 where he says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. It shall not stand. 
and it shall not come to pass. That was God's word for Ahaz. Now you see the love and provision of our God for his people. The Bible doesn't say that Ahaz turned to God for counsel, and yet God looks after his people. He works, he speaks through Isaiah, and he gets his message across to Ahaz and says, there's nothing to worry. Nothing will happen. Right? Stand firm. Um, stand firm in faith. Now, Ahaz... <laughs> Now, Ahaz heard the word of God, and it wasn't once, but it was twice if you read through the chapter. Now, I want want us to pause, and I want us to consider, what is the view that we have of our God? Do we always see him as a God who's full of anger, who's full of fury, who's there to give us consequences for all that we do wrong? Or do we see God as someone who's always on the lookout for his people, even when you and I don't look out for him? That's what we see here in this passage. A loving God who made provisions to take care of the fear, to take care of the uncertainty, to counsel Ahaz and his people at their time of greatest need. So how does Ahaz respond? Well, you'd think he'd he'd listen, right? He's heard from God Almighty. Now, in order to see that, we'll have to cross-reference. But in 2 Kings 16, verse 2, we read that Ahaz was 20 years old when he began his reign, And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as its father David had done. And then in verse 5, Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came to wage a war against Jerusalem, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. And then in verse 7, we see how Ahaz responds. He sends messengers to the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. And verse 8, Ahaz also took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasure of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. Isaiah's message fell on deaf ears. We see that in a very fear-driven political maneuver, What does King Ahaz do? He aligns with the greatest enemy, the Assyrians, to deliver him from his immediate trouble. We see that King Ahaz would rather trust on his enemy than put his trust on the word of a God in which he had to wait. Why could Ahaz not trust the counsel of God? Now, some of us might even feel a bit sorry for Ahaz, right? The enemy was right at his doorstep, Death and destruction was face was, was on their face, and it would be upon them any moment. How could he not take matters into his own hands? And yet, that was precisely what God's word to him was. The attack shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Back to the story of my admissions in college. So... Uh, so I'm in desperation, not sure what to do. Um, the, uh, the medical practitioner says there's no way I can get in. And there were actually two of us who were denied admissions due to the same reason, color blindness. We were desperate. We were seeing our dreams slowly go away. They were ebbing away. We had to do something. We had to take the matter in our own hands. We needed to find counsel on what to do. There was no one to give us counsel there. So what did we do? We turned to our own self, to our own counsel. And we said what we needed to do was to bribe that medical practitioner. <laughs> that was the only way we could get through. And so we approached, the, uh, we approached the medical attendant and we said, we will pay you something if you change the report, um, to which he agreed. <laughs> and then... Uh, what happened was we, the, the, admissions, um, uh, the, the, the admissions head fortunately came. He looked at the situation. He stopped that from happening, and he actually marked us as very borderline and gave us admissions. Now, th- that, that incident was over, and I went through it. I'm obviously very shameful of it, very repentant of it. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't an easy time with my family when they got to know of it. We lived in a small town. And it wasn't just the family. It's probably the whole town got to know about it. 
wasn't very easy. But I would always think back and say, why did I not wait? Why was it so difficult to wait? And I can understand why. Because I was looking at everything from my own lens. I was looking at counsel in my own selves. Friends, our inability to rely on the counsel of God is because we find it difficult to wait in a moment of big challenge. Ahaz found it very difficult to wait on the Lord. I found it very difficult. When nothing apparently seems to be happening, we try and take matters in our own hands. John 5 says that God the Father is always at work. It never ceases. And so can I encourage us to adopt a heart where we celebrate when we have to wait, celebration of waiting. What are some of the worries that shake the trees for us today? Maybe there are students and parents, you've just got your PSLE scores, and you're now waiting to see which school posting would happen. It's a few weeks away, right? And you're worried. Maybe your trees are shaken. You were thinking they'd get into a particular school, and it looks impossible now. You're worried, and you're tense. Maybe some of Some of you have lost your vocation, your job, and you've been waiting, but you just haven't got the next break. Time's running out. The tree's shaking. What do you do? Maybe there are some who've been waiting for a relationship to find someone you can spend the rest of your life with. Hasn't happened for years, and you continue waiting. Nothing's moving. Maybe there are some who are in a relationship, but that relationship is broken. Someone you love dearly, You've been waiting for reconciliation, just hasn't happened. How do we choose to wait wisely while waiting? So that was my second point. We all have a choice of our counselor. Which takes me to my third and final point, which is God's provision for a wonderful counselor. Now, if you look at Isaiah, we we look from chapter 7, but the first five chapters of Isaiah are united by a theme about trusting God instead of trusting human nations. As we saw in Isaiah 7 onwards, it is how God's people turned against him. They trusted the nations instead of trusting God. And then through the rest of verse chapter 7 and chapter 8, we actually see God's, um, God's curse for destruction upon the people for not obeying him. Isaiah announces that God would use the very Assyrians that Ahaz had opted to turn to for help to to devastate the nation. And the next chapter shows that the nation of Judah is in a very rapid decline. There's darkness all around. The axe of God's judgment is falling on them unabatedly. Isaiah 8 closes by signaling impending doom. The last verse of Isaiah 8 says, They will all look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into the thick darkness. What did the people of Judah need at that point? They needed protection, they needed rescue, and they needed it immediately. And how does God respond to their need for protection and rescue? Let's find out. Now, in this moment of darkness comes another message from God through a prophet who's familiar to his people by now, right? Isaiah. Isaiah Isaiah was totally realistic about the darkness that was engulfing Judah, and yet he had hope. And as we enter chapter 9, we actually move from darkness into something which is of light. There is no more gloom, verse 1 says. Misery takes away and gives birth to joy. Despondency actually turns into delight. So verse 2 of Isaiah 9 says, The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You see the love of God the Father. You see the love of God for his people. He continues to look after them. You know, when I I look at this, it's like, how does the light come into darkness, right? How how is this light going to come? And verse 6 explains it by saying, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. So what Isaiah's solution to Judah on the impending attack is to say that you're facing darkness now, But don't worry, there's a child who's going to be born, a baby, that's it. It's almost like, you know, if you think about the early days of the war between Russia and Ukraine, the takeover of Ukraine seemed imminent, right, the first few days or the first few weeks. And I can imagine the people of Ukraine who are very scared, they're just waiting, Russia's bombing, Uh, it's only a matter of time before cities would be taken over. And at that point, 
if God were to come and say, wait, help is near. There is a woman who's pregnant and there is a baby. It does seem to be a very unpragmatic solution at that point. For the people of Judah, they were facing invasion from a huge, unstoppable army. And the solution would be a tiny baby. <clears throat> How does this all work out? Now, there's something about this baby that Isaiah sees. How would this baby save? Isaiah saw that this child was unique. Firstly, as we read in verse 6, it says, To us a child is born, to us a son is given. It's a child who is born, it's a child who is given. And what that means is, this child came in flesh, and that's why he was born, but he was also God, and that is why he was given. We spoke earlier about the challenges of waiting in moments of crisis, in moments of challenge. As we fail to wait, we make wrong choices. We listen to wrong counsel. Left to myself, I'll usually turn very quickly from the God of the Bible to the God of immediacy, the God who provides a solution, the God of efficiency, the God of convenience. False God who promises a lot of things, but which isn't lasting. We're in a season of celebrating the birth of the child that Isaiah prophesied here in, here in Isaiah 9. Advent reminds us that there is joy and celebration as we wait for the one who is coming. Advent is a proclamation of the sufficiency of Christ through the discipline of waiting. Our inability to wait on the Lord makes us choose a counsel which is unwise. How then do we celebrate in waiting? How can we be absolutely sure of waiting in the child that is born, the son that is given. Isaiah expands on that, on who this baby would be. He promises the events of the first Christmas. Someone was coming who would do far more than just bring victory from the Assyrians. This would be one who would be glorious, who would be a messiah, who would be an ideal monarch. He would come from the Davidic rule. He would make the land glorious. He would bring shalom, peace into the world. Isaiah sets forth the person and the character and the role of this great deliverer. And he says, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. But why should we look at this child? Why should we look at Jesus? Because he is a wonderful counselor. So I'll very quickly look at um, two things. Firstly, he is wonderful. And secondly, he is our counselor. Now, the word wonderful in this passage <clears throat> literally means incomprehensible. So the Messiah will cause us to be full of wonder. Now the Hebrew word that is used to describe wonder is to separate, to set apart, to distinguish. And throughout the Old Testament we see that word is translated into a number of interesting ways. It is someone which, who is marvelous. It is someone who is hidden, something that you don't see you know, very obviously. Someone who is very difficult to replicate. Someone who is miraculous. It carries the basic meaning of something that is unique and different. Burton Russell claims that most of human sins is caused by boredom. Our lack of wonder is one of the causes of boredom. We are surrounded by a lot of technology, and yet we are bored. But we need to be careful that we do not confuse wonder of the world from what the true definition of wonder is, which is the wonder that is found in Christ. The word wonder is much weightier than the way it's used in normal con conversations today. We say things are wonderful when we like them, when they're pleasant, when they're lovely. We use it very flippantly today. But we live in a world where wonder is largely lost, and we lose sight of the wonder of God as we move away from depending on Him. This is where we lose Him as our wonderful counselor. So before we look at Jesus who is wonderful, let's also look at what are some of the ways in which we lose sight of the wonder of Jesus. The first thing is we often think of wonder as something that comes out of ignorance, right? You go to a new city, you go on a new holiday, you see a new toy, you see a new device, you are wonder. You're filled with wonder, you're amazed. But actually, wonder doesn't come from ignorance. The wonder that comes from ignorance is very, very temporary. The real true wonder comes from knowledge. Romans 11 says that the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God is unsearchable. His ways are inscrutable. 
right? For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? And then in Colossians 1, it says, For in him, that is in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So everything that is in God is in Jesus. And that is who he is. He is full of depths of riches, of wisdom, of knowledge. He is unsearchable in his judgment. That is who Jesus is. Because Christ is so deep, as we gain knowledge of him, our wonder grows. Because we can never be out of knowledge of him. He, he, is, uh, he is so infinite in who he is. And therefore, as we look at Jesus and we look at his wonder, that is the true wonder that will continue to, to capture us. Secondly, we also build substitutes for wonder. And hence, we lose a true wonder. The greatest substitute of all is sin, which is really the very essence of kind of what we worship outside of God. And basically what we do is we substitute the wonder of God and substitute it with sin in our lives. We look at things that are quick fixes, things that will give us pleasure, things that will give us joy, happiness in the short term. But real joy, real wonder can come only through Christ. Now, Jesus is wonderful in a way that is mind-boggling. <clears throat> you think about Jesus and you see that the one who had the entire universe under him came and he didn't have a place where he could be born. He had to be born in a stable. You think about Jesus and you think about his life on earth. You think about all the miracles that he did. They were all wonderful. He turned water into wine. He made his disciples walk on water. He raised one from the dead. All of these were wonderful signs. But the greatest wonder was how Jesus took the shameful symbol of the cross and he gave it a symbol where God's love and man's sin met. Consider the wonder of his death. He knew he would die. He came to die. He was prepared to die. And that was his way of reconciling us to his father. Jesus is wonderful because his ways are beyond us. Who could have thought of and imagined that the only way to reconcile us to the Father was by, by, by dying on the cross, by having one who is sinless to die on our behalf. But that is the depth of God's wisdom. That is the, that is the, um, yeah, that's the depth of his wisdom that we cannot understand. And yet, as we gain in knowledge of that, we are struck with wonder. Secondly, he is our counselor. As we saw earlier, we are all in need of counsel every day. We need to be careful where we receive counsel from. You'll see in Genesis 3, even Adam and Eve received counsel from the devil. But God in his love and provision has given people around us. He's given people with wisdom, love, and care who can guide us with good, godly wisdom. However, giving counsel to his people is one of God's most gracious work. We see in James where it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without re reproach. But is Jesus qualified to be our counselor? Of course he is. He has everything that is the fullness of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ Jesus became to us a wisdom from God. So as we look at Jesus, as our wonderful counselor, we have the wisdom of God. Now, often a professional counselor will hear words like, oh, but you don't understand what I'm going through. And that is true, right? For us, you know, when we counsel people, um, we cannot or will not have all the experiences that that person has gone through. But in Jesus, we have one who doesn't only have the wisdom of God, but he came in flesh he went through all the emotions, all the struggles. He went through all the temptations that you and I have gone through and even more as he gave up his life on cross. So we can come to this wonderful counselor because he is one who has experienced it all. I'd like to conclude by saying that we began today by saying that it is very important. Uh, names are very important for us. Names are important in the Bible. Names gives us identity. Jesus gave up his name, gave up his identity by taking on flesh, 
by coming as an infant, by coming as a baby. The all-powerful one took the form of an infant, but God exalted him to a name above all names. And we who put our trust in Christ's finished work on the cross are saved by his name. As we said earlier, all of us need counsel in our life every day, right? We cannot escape from it. But the question is, who do we look to for counsel? Do we celebrate in waiting? Can we trust in our wonderful counselor to give us the right counsel? Jesus Christ is the most wonderful counselor. He's the one who, in his wisdom, gave up his life so that we could be with God forever. I'd like to end by very quickly talking about four applications. And I'd really like to end by looking at a few very practical ways by which Jesus counsels us. Right? So the first thing is, Jesus doesn't have office hours. If you go to a counselor, you've got to take an appointment, right? You've got to uh, fix up a time, right? If the counselor is speaking to someone else, you've got to wait. Jesus doesn't require that. We've got to realize that Jesus is not a thing, but he is a person, that we can come to him at any time. So if you're at a crossroad this afternoon, if you're struggling through a decision, go to Jesus, go to him for counsel. He is there for you. Secondly, Jesus speaks to us through his word. The Bible is not a stack of verses that we kind of read and take up, but God uses his word to counsel us. He uses his word to shape us. So look to his word. Thirdly, Jesus listens to us through prayer. He is available for us. Prayer is just talking to Jesus. Talk to him. Bring to him what your worries are. And then lastly, Jesus gives us community to point to him. We have this community here, the body. And we all serve one king, one God. And what we do is we point each other to that God, to that wonderful counselor. Will you join me as I close in prayer? Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for the gift of a wonderful counselor. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that that we recognize, Lord, that we often fail to look for counsel in Christ. And instead, we look for counsel outside. And that is because, Lord, we find it so difficult to wait on you. Lord, we do not see the true extent of your wonder. Lord, we are easily distracted by the small wonders of this world. Help us, Lord, to see that wonder that is in you, Christ. We thank you for this gift that you've given us, a wonderful counselor to lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.